what's happening, party people? I'm replacing Robbie Kramer for a moment just to introduce uh, our next speaker, who's a pretty amazing guy. If there were four things that truly changed my life, it would be my experience in the seduction community and what women taught to me and all that fun stuff. It would be what I learned here about paleo and, and having the you know, what my physical body was meant to be and, and eating right and all that sort of stuff. Meditation, we had speakers speak on that as well. And then the fourth thing would be my experience with martial arts and finding myself through those things. I've uh, trained martial arts for forever, for all my life, you know, since I was a boy in many different styles and with amazing teachers. And uh, the guy who I'm about to introduce to you today is literally the best hands down person that I've worked with and who's taught me the most about myself and is a reflection in, in, in all of my life and what we do. And probably one of the most dangerous guys that you will ever, ever meet. Uh, his name is Edward Aiken. He runs a company called Force Dynamics with an X.com, which we will tell you all about. Ed, there you go. All right, thank you. All right, so, all right, let's see if I can do this justice here. Um, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Anthony, for, for giving me the opportunity to be here. I'm based out of Austin, Texas. So I don't do a whole lot of these uh, speaking things, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. But I do do a lot of teaching. And I want to start with a little brief, brief background on myself because it sets the frame for what we're going to learn about today. Okay? And it's a concept I call forcing the dark side. And um, before you start thinking it's about stalking ladies of the night, putting them in the trunk of your car, uh, it's a, it's a little bit of that. It's a little bit of that. So there's a lot of useful things in here. But we will define what this is. And um, it's really more, uh, so if you guys aren't in martial arts, don't worry about it. This is a concept that has changed my life um, in many ways. And hopefully if, you, uh, if we get to the point where I can you know, define it clearly for you, what it is, why you should develop it, and how you can develop that uh, given the time, um, and you guys actually put in the applications, you will see some amazing results for yourself. So um, getting back to uh, myself, I've been doing martial arts for 30 some odd years. I'm 40 now. Um, so I started very early. And um, the reasons I got into the martial arts are very similar to the reasons why a lot of people get in the seduction community. Okay, I was basically um, the, the AFC of the fighting world. I, was a, I grew up in rural Michigan. I had no uh, friends to play with, so I had little to no social skills when I was younger. And so by the time I got to a larger uh, school, I, I started getting my ass handed to me every day by this group of guys, and it got worse and worse over the years. So um, uh, my mother, bless her, uh, had had enough. So by the time I was about um, in sixth grade, she decided to uh, enroll me in some martial arts. And I had had some judo and some other things when I was a little bit younger. Um, but this was really out of a necessity to, to stop getting beat up every day. And so, of course, um, back then, uh, we didn't really have functional martial arts, right? We had YMCA karate and some taekwondo and maybe some, some crazy kung fu stuff. So the very act of enrolling me in martial arts didn't really help the ass beatings, and forgive my French, but they actually uh, increased them, especially the first fight when my karate actually came out. Yeah, it, it wasn't good. So, um, but that was the... the, the impetus for me to, to get into the martial arts was really self-preservation. Okay? It, it had nothing to do with the traditional, uh, tradition of the martial arts or that side of things, which now I've come full circle to appreciate. But it was really you know, just much like a, the AFC out there with girls who, who's shot down time after time after time, I was getting beat up time after time after time. And so what this, this did to me is it made me, uh, after, uh, after training, and I didn't want to give up my training, um, to seek out a functional martial art. And it took me to about the age of 17 uh, to actually find something. And, and it's an art called Jeet Kune Do Concepts. And it's really Bruce Lee's approach of how to train in the martial arts. And really back then, uh, it's a precursor to MMA. It's cross-training. These guys were boxing, kickboxing, using weapons, doing some grappling. And so it was finally at the age of 17 that um, I found a functional art. And so it was really through this self-preservation um, journey, the, the, the really because all the, all the philosophy in the world and, and the martial arts at that time did me no good when I was actually in school and after school and in, you know, on the playground getting, getting beat up. It didn't help. And um, this is one of those things that it's behind uh, this, this idea of killer instinct. 
And what Killer Instinct is, it's really, it's, it's an idea. But it's the base of Killer Instinct is what I call primal driver. And the reason that we have martial arts in the first place is out of that primal driver, and it's very similar to the reason why we have the seduction community, which is also a primal driver. And so when we start working with these forces, right, which we'll get into a little bit more, they are universal forces out there. This is why when, when people are in the seduction community and they really get into connecting with women, right, they're tapping into that primal source. And what is that primal source? Well, what drives the seduction community, the very existence of it, is for us as a species to procreate, right? We as men have that drive to go out and seek out women to ensure that we spread the seed to make sure that the species survives so we can experience life. Well, the same thing in the martial arts, when we have killer instinct or self-preservation, we need that to ensure that our family, ourselves and our tribe are going to be safe, right? When we started um, going through warring times and we actually had tribes, we had other warring tribes come in and if your tribe was wiped out, we didn't survive. So this is a primal driver to also experience life that we're tapping into. And I call it forcing the dark side because we have to, we have to get, we're talking about life and death and we have to get in touch with that. And it's not necessarily uh, on the surface a good thing in many contexts, right? We don't want to just walk out there and be this, this sadistic animal. It doesn't work in the modern world. But as a result of the modern world, we've lost touch with this. Many of us have. You know, and, and a lot of that is social programming. A lot of that has to do with our environment. You know, sitting in front of the computer, it limits our focus. We don't get to express ourselves as men. So I wanted to use this subject um, because I think it's a good theme for this, uh, uh, this venue. But um, going back to myself, right around when I was 17, um, and I started training in Jeet Kune Do Concepts, I started turning the tides in my fight. I started having some results. There were still fights where I would stalemate with people. I'd still get black eyes. I'd still, you know, not be where I wanted to be. I still didn't have the self-image that I needed. I, years and years of, of you know, not having social skills will do damage to your self-image. But it was through this that led me to um, go to California and start training with um, another JKD expert, Paul Vunak. And at the time, uh, I believe I was 19 when I started training with him, um, he was just getting done uh, with his contract with SEAL Team 6 out of Virginia Beach. Okay? And Vunak uh, is, is uh, one of the biggest influences on my life. But he also has, um, in the martial arts community, at that time he kind of was a sore subject because he was just about fighting. Okay? He was in the streets uh, perfecting his, his art you know, in actual bad situations. We're not talking about just you know, a mano a mano with one guy. He put himself in really bad situations to see what worked. Okay? And that caught the eye of the government who then in turn wanted him to train SEAL Team 6. And how he got, yeah, how he got the eye of the government is a whole nother story. But so what happened was when he started training SEAL Team 6 in Virginia Beach, then these guys took uh, his whole system and actually applied it in combat, but they also would apply it into the biker bars and the bar scene down in Virginia Beach and come back with infield reports, much like the seduction community, right? Like, oh, what happened with this? Like, this guy came out of the blue. Like, so it was um, so very similar, but out of this, this idea of killer instinct evolved. So it evolved to a point where when I started training with him, he still had government people coming to his house and we, we, um, uh, we had a lot of the SEAL team. So I got very intimate, uh, got to see behind the scenes of this development of this because this is the key, especially if you're talking about a combat situation, the SEALs have to be able to turn their killer instinct on and turn it off. Okay, and that's part of what we're talking about. We have to have the ability to go from zero to 100, but back to zero, to keep a calm head, right? It does no good if you're in a long range firefight to be at 100, okay? You have to keep a calm head. And this is the same thing in a street fight. If we start out at 100 and we're, we're, we're matched with a superior size biker who's spent some time in, in prison, he's on steroids, PCP, and he wants to eat your face, right? If we go force on force with that, especially me with my size, I'm going to lose. So there's a time and place to tap into this side of ourselves. And when we do tap into it, it is that killer, sadistic, total disdain for that which is in front of you. And that's a person who is trying to hurt you. But I want to go back and, I, and I'm going to use the analogy of a street fight because I'm not 
uh, I'm hoping none of you ever has to street fight. But really, the street fight is an analogy for life, right? There's struggle, there's opposition, there's stress. There's hopefully sometimes when you're in trouble, your friends will jump in, but most of the time you're left to fend for yourself, okay? There's a beginning and there's an end, and sometimes there are those that conspire against you. So it really is an analogy of a struggle. But I don't want you to, to um, think of just this in the context of a street fight, because when I break this down, the killer instinct, right, we can put any context in there. We can take out the word street fight and we can put pickup. We can take out the word pickup and we could put you know, uh, business negotiation. So these elements in Killer Instinct are going to be there. It's just to what degree do we express them. We're not going to express this when we're in a business negotiation, but we may need that unspoken to get that negotiation. Okay, and I'll share a story later on that Phil, one of my students, shared with me before we got on. It's a good demonstration of Killer Instinct. But I want to get into a little bit more of, of what this is. Um, and part of it is being able to turn it on and turn it off. See, the turning off part is just as important as turning it on because we do have to keep a calm head. We have to assess. We have to see when the opportunity presents itself so that we can go in and destroy that which is trying to destroy us. Make sense? Okay. So let's talk about killer instinct a little bit more. Um, what I call, uh, just for demonstration purposes. We're going to look at things as a scale. All right? And in the context of, of a street fight, we'll call this the scale of bad intentions, right? When it's not a street fight, we can call it the scale of intent and action. Because what I'm going to give you today is really <clears throat> It's really a way for you to tap into a part of yourself that's there. Everybody has it. Believe me, I know. Because I was that introverted kid. In fact, my wife, before I came here, I told her she couldn't come because I get a little nervous, right? And so we had the luxury of going back home to see my family. And, and um, of course, any time that happens, your family has evidence of what you used to be, right? And I was the head geek. I was actually the drum major for my band, which you can imagine didn't help my fighting life very much, right? <laughs> but while I was there, unbeknownst to me, my mom had given her some plaques that I had earned as being the drum major in the band. So she was bringing those out, you know, because I told her she couldn't come. She said, well, while you're talking about Killer Instinct, just remember who you are. I was like, oh, ooh. and then I demonstrated this side of Killer Instinct, and I let her live, right? I, was, oh, I took that. So, but that's part of it. So it's something that, uh, the reason I'm sharing that is because it's something we can develop. If I can develop it, anybody can. And we need to develop it. Not because we're going to go out and street fight, but because as men, we don't get to express ourselves. We don't get to tap into this side often enough. And conversely, some of us are so much here, we don't know how to do this. Right? Where we're going we're gonna to get more in touch with our feminine side, more assessing. And both are equally important. Okay? And, and what happens is by going to these extremes, you gain emotional mastery. Okay? You're gaining a part of yourself. You're waking up that, that sleeping giant within yourself because it's a primal driver. Okay? It, is, it is key or chi. It is life force that you tap into. Okay? It's not something we can sustain 100% of the time or even for very long because it, it taps our physical strength. But when you go there, and I'll show you how to do that, more often you will get more things for yourself. You'll be more assertive. Okay, and you don't even have to oftentimes say anything because this is, this is a primal mover of our species. And when you tap into it, other people, you will move other people. They will sense it. Okay? And the same thing on this side. And we're able to turn it down and we're, we're okay with not being that. Okay? Make sense so far? Okay. So, the scale of bad intentions. Killer instinct is knowing both where you're at and where your opponent is at on that scale of bad intentions. So that you have the, both the ability and the knowledge to act accordingly in conjunction with that which opposes you. Okay, so in a conversation, it's that perfect timing of when, when to enter that close. Okay, or when, it, when to interject whatever it is you need to get your goal. Okay, in a street fight, <clears throat> and, and 
Once again, this is, this is the analogy. But most people, when they, when they want to fight you, they're going to do so out of anger. Okay? Some people, they'll attack you for criminal reasons. But most of the time, a street fight is, um, is somebody out of anger. And I want to make this distinction. When I talk about a street fight, I'm talking about a, a life and death situation. I'm not talking about two guys going down the street and, and settling things. Okay? Because we have to treat it with the respect it deserves. Okay? Any physical altercation can it turn deadly. Even if it's a shoving match. Someone can shove you, you fall down, hit your head, you're dead. Okay? You push somebody, they hit your head, they're dead. And you have to treat it like that. So if we decide to go to this, our life is on the line in a street fight. Okay? That's very important. But this, this isn't a blind rage. This is a focused, focused state that I'm going to teach you how to get that will help other areas of your life. Okay? And you don't have to develop it through fighting. But this is what I'm, what I'm talking about. So <clears throat> we have this state. And when somebody is going to attack you, usually they're going to be at a 10. Let's say it's a scale of 1 to 10. They're pissed off. Where we want to be is at a 0 or a 1. Okay? We need to assess what's going on. We have to open our focus and our awareness to see what's happening. Okay? If we have the luxury of space. If, I, if, I'm, if we're going to fight and you're over there, this is, this is good for me, provided there's no weapons. Okay? But I get the chance to observe both where you're at, what's around you, what's around me, what your intentions are, do you have a weapon, right? what's my internal state, and, and your focus is on me. Okay? So we have to have this, this difference of focus. If we are to survive a situation where this guy is much bigger than us, perhaps more skilled, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. If I go force on force, I'm going to lose. So I have to bide my time to get the right shots at, at, with the right intensity without taking damage. Because I don't want to take any damage if I can, if I can help it. Okay? So <clears throat> when they're at a 10, we're at a 0 or a 1. And then as we go through the fight, we pot shot, we move, we, we inflict pain, they start going down, we start going up. And at the right moment, we enter at 100%. So we have to have the ability to go from 0 to 100, but also back down to 0 should my pass not work. OK, make sense? Because it's really not the pass that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the ability to turn it on, turn it off, turn it on again, and turn it back off. Not because of what I want, but because of what's actually happening in the moment. And you cannot predict that. You may do a pass, and it doesn't work. You have to go back to 0. OK? And this is something Steve needs to learn. Where is he? OK, so we have four components of the actual overall scale, right? <clears throat> and these are also on a scale. So we're going to define these. All right. First one is going to be, and these are in no particular order, our focus. Second is our intent. Third are our actions, and finally, our emotions. OK, so our focus, provided we have the luxury of distance. Okay? And this is going to be true for conversations that you're in or wh whatever it is. It can be presenting. right? Your focus, when you're at this end of the scale, has to be wide. Okay? You have to take in the entire setting. You have to know what's behind you, where your possible dangers are, where your exits are, right? Who's friends with who? Are there weapons involved? So we have to turn down our internal dialogue, which we'll, we'll get to next is our intent or our thought process. But our actual physical focus with our eyes needs to widen. And when you do this, you put yourself in an alpha state. Does anybody know what an alpha state is? It's like a light hypnotic trance. You're able to take in more information so you can process more without your conscious mind getting involved. Because if you overthink things, you're not going to pick up the threats out there. Or he may move in, and now you're in danger city because you were thinking, oh my god, I, I left the, the stove on. Okay? When you're here, so that's one. We, we'll, we'll, we'll list this over here. We have a wide focus. Actually, I should reverse that for you all. Wide focus. This is 0, 100. Right? So what's our focus when we, when we make our decision? When we go in with our blast, 
right? Where we actually make the decision that we can take this big guy out of commission with, with our, our killer instinct, our bad intentions, our dark side, right? Where's our focus? So if it's wide, what do we have over here? Narrow, Narrow right? Oftentimes, when you train this sufficiently, you will black out. And this is, this is actual physiological function. When people get into life and death situations, something happens fast, you become hyper-focused. So a lot of the peripheral will, will go away. Not always, but a lot of times it'll go away. So we want to take our focus and shift it to just that one thing that's right in front of us. So if it's a goal, that when we decide to go through and destroy our obstacle or to get our goal, our focus is on that and that's it. That's all that exists. Whereas out here, we're assessing everything that we can. We're open, we're assessing. We're not labeling, we're just, we are just assessing what, what is and what is happening. We're not adding to it, and we're getting out of the subjective mind, right? Our focus becomes narrow. Our intent or our thought process, when we're over here, our thought process is to be assessing and observing, right? <clears throat> but we also want to be not rattled. In other words, you want to be safe on, under, under uh, pressure. You're going to have blows coming at you, right, in, in the context of a street fight. But we want to have a detachment. It doesn't mean apathetic. And this is true for conversations or for pickup or whatever it is, right? When you are in this state of things and you're open and you're assessing what's going on, it's like you're light and playful, right? You cannot, you have to have some sort of emotional attachment. If you're apathetic, especially in conversation, the other person will pick it up. You don't care at all. There's no emotional attachment. It's going to blow the whole thing, unless that's your goal. Right? If that's your goal, then that's fine. But in a street fight, we have to have some element, some emotional attachment. So there's going to be a little bit of fear there. And a little bit of fear is OK. But we don't want that to overwhelm us. Okay? So we want the thought process of being more of assessing. You know, nice shirt, nice tie. Watch out for the traffic back there. Hey, the cops are coming over there. That lady's on her cell phone. This guy might have a weapon. You know, what, whatever it is, it's assessing. We might be adding a little bit to it, but it's more in the language of, hey, watch out, this might happen. Okay, we're assessing. Whereas this, the intent, the thought process behind when we go to 100% in our killer instinct is one or nothing. Okay. It's one or nothing. Either you have no thought in that moment, and, we, and that's hard to sustain if, it's, if we're able to sustain it at all, right? It's one or nothing. And that one could be go, could be kill, could be fuck you, could be a scream. Whatever it is, whatever your mantra is, you do it. Mine, I tend to black out. I tend to, to not remember. Just, well, well, guy's on the ground. Oh, okay. Not always, but, you know. That's, that's the intent. But the intent is one or nothing. And when we can go from this, right, we're just, we're up and moving to this, we go 100%, that's the thought. When you can get, and it's a feeling, right? I can demonstrate it, but it's the feeling. When you can get that, that intention, more often, you're going to see a whole bunch of things happen for you. Because a lot of us are ADHD now, just by the very, very nature of things. There's so much going on. Or we're too narrowly focused, but we're over here. Right? Focus should be here when we're intense, but we're trained to be focused on our computer. We, we don't look at the peripheral. So it's, it's killing this over here, the very fact that we have to stay in our cubicles. So at my company, I have a saying that says, kill your cubicle, because if we're training to be in this box. Right? It's a prison cell. So if you physically go out and kill your cubicle, film it. Okay, if you go and you, ah, and you actually throw your computer, that's not what I'm talking about. But if you do that, film it. Give it to me. I want to I use it. Okay? But I'm, I'm talking about the cubicle in your mind. Because we really do, physically, when we're here. And I'm not saying you can't have, you know, great things don't come from writing or all that. But me, personally, when I spend too much time on the computer, I can feel it. I have to go back out and physically change my focus. Go through the routine I'm going to show you guys so I can remind myself that of that, that I have this, this motivation side of me, that I have the ability to do what I want versus I don't even know that exists. I, I got to pay the next bills, okay? So that's our intent. One or nothing or more of observing and assessing. Actions. Well, in a street fight, actions 
are more of a lateral type of footwork. We're responsive. We're not 100% defensive. We're side to side, we're moving. We are gonna inflict damage over here, but we're in long range, we're moving, we're assessing this guy. Does he have a boxing structure? Does he have a tie boxing structure? Is he an MMA fighter? What is it? Are his friends involved? So, but at the same time, we don't wanna be passive and we do not wanna be 100% defensive. We may move back because we have to, but then we wanna go off to the side. So our actions, if you can get the analogy, are going to be more playful, right? We're gonna move, move, and you, you, you aren't going forward, but you're not going back, okay? So obviously, our actions on this are 100% offensive. When we're punching, we punch uninterruptedly. When we deliver our big tools, it's gonna to be our elbows, knees, headbutts, thumbs in the eyes, knee in the groin, and a, maybe a bite if we have to. It's the most vicious things you can do to somebody in the least amount of time. So you have to have this squared away. It's not that if somebody picks a fight with me or attacks me and I outclass them that I'm gonna do this to them. You will injure to a degree. It's not that you'll black out and go, oh my God, I just destroyed this guy. You will have, if you have any sort of moral code, it's not something, this is focused, but the intent behind it, should I need to go there, it's there for me. Make sense? If you need it, it's there. Hopefully you'll never need it. It's a, gun, it's a 45 in your back pocket. You'll never pull it. But you know you have it, and they can sense you have it, right? That's when you start getting killer instinct, when people can sense that. And I'll, I'll share what Phil shared with me. Uh, Phil's one of my students back there, and he was just sharing a story with me that at his work, um, in his new job, he blew away the guys, the guys who have been there for a while, he blew away their numbers the last two weeks. Is that right? So these guys, a um, little bit jealous of him, they started messing with him in a call. During a call, they unplugged his headphones, okay? So Phil wanted to kill them, and Phil trains, so he wants to straight blast these guys, but of course he can't do that. So Phil, what does he do? His killer instinct is just as much about this over here, calming himself, right, in the face of, of, of the feelings that he wants to kill these guys, he has to control his reaction to those feelings, okay? And all he gave them was a look. Maybe you said, so what'd you say? I just told him no. Like, no. I told him no. Told him no. It wasn't no, don't do it. They got, like, it was the nonverbal no. Like, they could sense there was something else there because he, he trains. He, you know, when, when guys can, and you don't have to train, but you can still get that feeling. It, you know, a father will do it to his child, no. But, but it's that when you're doing it to another man, right, and you have that, there's that innate thing that we've, we have fought and bled and died for, that pecking order, all, the, all, the, all of that that we've earned as a species is there. And when you have that, other men will notice. It's not about being alpha or an AMOG or any of that, but it's having an emotion, uh, uh, tapping into an emotion that can be used for very bad things. And other men will notice that. But like I said, it's not a round, round you don't show it off. When you choose to show it off, they'll know. But, I'm, you know, half you guys, I'm sure, if I was walking around, aren't going to go, oh, that guy's really tough. And I'm not, I'm not tough. I'm not tough at all. I was the, remember, I was the drum major. You guys, so I'm a, <laughs> believe me, I am anything but tough, but I am trained, and I can go there. And if you attack me or my family or, or cut me off in traffic, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> okay? So, but those are the actions, and now we get to the emotions, okay? What are the emotions behind this? Because that's the biggest thing, really, in this whole thing, is tapping into your emotions, and subsequently being able to, to silence them to some degree. We can never, if you're a, a moral, compassionate, normal human being, turn off your emotions without severe side effects. You can't. So there are people that don't have emotions, right? Sociopaths, or they get some sick sort of emotion out of really bad things, right? Or they're, even with training, we see the, the whole reason for PTSD is because of the emotional side. Not the whole reason, but that has a big impact upon it, right? We don't stifle these emotions. They'll happen. Your, your mind and your brain will react to, to violence, and it will imprint you. So whether it's violence or whatever it is, we don't control our emotions. 
but we can get to the point where our emotions don't control us. So we control our reactions to our emotions. And that, in turn, will help to dispel the emotions. Okay? So when I get out, you know, was I nervous before when I first got here? Hell yeah, I was nervous. Was I nervous before that? Yeah. In street fights, when I, and I've had plenty of street fights, bad, bad situations. The buildup of the street fights, was I ever nervous? Yeah. Every time. Especially when somebody's mouthy and they're directing it towards me and you know it's coming, right? You just know, I hate that because all those memories of the kids in class, like you're getting after class, we're going to beat your ass and just sitting there and taking it. All that comes up too, right? But the moment the fight happens with training, none of that exists. It doesn't. And over time, the more I do this, the feeling comes up, I can dissipate it. It's a high level state control. Right? It's just like approach anxiety. Same thing. But with time and with practice, people can start to control that approach anxiety. And there are top guys, I'm sure, who always have it and never goes away. Or, or you know, sometimes it does, it's not there, but sometimes it is. But it's your reaction and how you react to that that will determine, help determine the outcome. Okay? So our emotions, when we are out here, when we're non-rattled, right? we want to have some sort of detachment. But we want to <clears throat> almost be aloof, okay? We want some sort of emotional attachment, but it's more of aloofness. You don't care. You don't, you're not attached to the outcome, but yet you are uh, uh, attached to the process, right? You care about the process. You're involved. You're present, but you're not attached to any outcome, right? In the fight, it's like, oh, shit, that was a nice shot. Ooh, watch out for that. Oh, yeah, you know? Maybe you're talking shit a little bit. Once you get good, you might, yeah, oh, nice shot, right? Because you want to take them from a 10 down to a 2, so shit talking has its place. But our emotions on this, what are they? When we decide to kick in, it's every bad intention you could imagine. You have utter disdain for this person in front of you. It's rage. It's fear. It is commitment, right? It is, it is just pure destruction. It is chaotic because you need it at that moment because if you don't have it, you're going to be overwhelmed or perhaps you will die. So you have to kick into it. But if you do that without this, you may not have control. And this happens to people all the time. They're in their box and they've never experienced this. And all of a sudden they get fired. And all of a sudden, their girlfriend breaks up with them. All of a sudden, their dog gets run over. All of a sudden, they find themselves here without ever having been here, and now they're popping off rounds in their old workplace, right? Because it consumes them. They don't know how to deal with it. And that's not what we want. We want the ability to turn it on and turn it off. On and off. So our emotions are whatever to the umpth degree when they're expressed, we have to feel it. So we have to conjure that up. So I think I've got like 25 minutes, so I'm going to try to get to the how-to of each of these because we can do that. We don't have to do martial arts. Martial arts is one of the best way, ways to, to develop this, but we have to do something physical. And I think everybody here, almost everybody here is in the health and fitness. So there's some form of exercise that you can do to help develop this. You can't develop it to the degree that I'm telling you without something physical. It's impossible. Okay? A lot of this is mental, but it's the physicality that will, will bring it out of you, doing something physical in conjunction with all these. Okay? So let's look at the focus. This is just an exercise in widening our focus using our peripheral vision and narrowing it. Okay? So all we have to do is something physical. When, when we are assessing the room, look at my posture, I'm looking up and I'm using my peripheral vision, and I'm using this, this anchor, this kinesthetic anchor, to look around, okay? So you can literally walk around and practice your focus, but what happens when we want to zero in on something? What do we do physically with our eyes? Squint. You squint. Your chin goes down. You look. See, me, when I'm talking to somebody, especially like Steve, I look at his nose, I'm thinking about, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> Yeah, there's a little sexual energy over here. Mm, fuck you up. Um, but that's, you know, it's, a, it's that feeling, but the squinting. See, when, you, when we focus in on something. So you want to practice oscillating between the extremes. And each one of these, that's the secret. When you oscillate between the extremes, 
and you can do it at will. You don't need a cue. You don't need to get pumped up. It just happens. Okay? And, and you'll see with fighters, you know, they have to get to a certain state <coughs> before, before they do that, before they get into their fight. That's something a little bit different. Okay? And they have the luxury of time. See, an MMA fight or a cage fight is not a street fight. And so we don't have the luxury of preparing for it other than our, our training outside of it. But when it happens, it's going to happen. Hopefully it never does. But if it's going to and it happens, we have to have the ability to respond instantly to it. Otherwise, you're fucked. Right? If somebody jumps out uh, from a bush and is intent on attacking you and you don't have that in your mind and no training, you'll, you'll well have some fight or flight. But most of the chances, if you don't have that ability to, to you know, the guy actually physically grabs you and throws you and you can't kick into that, it's, it's going to be a tough night for you. Okay? But you don't even need it for that. But it's that ability to go from 0 to 100 that is the secret. Okay? So we want to oscillate back and forth from wide to this. So you can just pick one thing out in the room, look at it, and go wide. And look at it. Right? And this can be used in seduction. And actually, I told Steve a long time ago, because I, I occasionally look at some of his stuff. I'm married now. But I occasionally look at some of his stuff, right? And when he does his rapport cycling, what is that? That's like a fractionation. Is that, anybody familiar with your, your, his rapport cycling? So what he's doing is he's taking the state from a light, open, playful, and then he's turning up the intensity, and he's focusing. And then you go back, and it fractionates the subject. See, so this phenomena exists in everything, right? So our focus, we want to go from wide to narrow. So our intent, our thought process. Remember, we want to have as little internal dialogue as possible. We want to turn it down because we don't want to get caught up, caught up in the subjective mind. We don't want to get caught up with what's in here, if what we think should be out there, because we need to assess, especially in a life and death situation. You better know what's going on around you. If you don't know who's friends with who, that's your fault, because you're too focused. You need to open your awareness. So we need to have a type of, this type of, hey, look at that. Hey, look at that. Hey, look at that. We take the peripheral, and we're pointing it out to ourselves. So mentally, I'm like, nice blue shirt, nice light. That light's bright. You know, things that we're observing, right to me, that are in our peripheral. And then we want to focus in on one thing, and just that's the one thing that exists. So candy, right? But it's an oscillation. So we want to do this as an exercise, focus. Exercise, focus. Exercise, focus. Right? We want it like that. That's a simple way, and that's something you can do without the martial arts. But I'm going to put this all together for you in a physical activity that will elicit this out of you. Because if you're going to exercise anyway, you can do this without too many people going, what the fuck is that guy doing? <laughs> right? So that's what we want. We don't want to look too crazy, but we want to be able to be crazy when we want to. So our actions. If you're talking about footwork, side to side, right? So I can just literally jump rope, and then when I go to this, sprint forward and go back to jumping rope. Sprint forward, back. Emotions. So once we get all these things in sync, because we want to shift our focus, our intent, and our actions all at the same time, our emotions have to go with it. So what's one way to start to control emotions? Observe them. Breathe. Breathing. Breathing. And you will observe them. You will. You'll feel the initial, and then you'll observe where they go through your body. <clears throat> Breathing. So when we're here, easiest way is to breathe from your diaphragm. Just that. Remind yourself, breathe from your diaphragm more often. Because we carry our emotions to a large extent up here, especially when it's life or death. So we can purposely guide our emotions up here. I always like to make that like it goes up your, your thing because it comes from our base from here to here. And usually when you're exerting yourself, you're going to breathe from there anyway, if it's 100%, if it's a, a sprint, a burpee, something like that, okay, where you're going 100%. You want to breathe from up here. Okay? So what's an exercise where we can use all these that I can give you guys? <coughs> Well, one thing I'll suggest, 
and I think hitting stuff is one of the best ways, but since some of you guys probably won't do that, <clears throat> hitting other human beings is even better, right? It's probably the best thing. But what we'll do is <clears throat> we have our focus. So what is your focus? One of the best things, very simple, easy. I'm going to just put, write this down. Tabata rounds. Who knows what Tabata rounds are? Anybody? What's a Tabata round? 20 seconds from the next after I hit and then 10 seconds from that. Right. So 20 seconds, the, so let's, you pick an exercise. It can be squats, it can be, can be whatever, right? What are these types of squats called? The, uh, jump squats. No? Never mind. You can do jump squats, but whatever. Okay, so. <laughs> So whatever your exercise, it can be push-ups, it can be burpees, whatever it is. But in, in my opinion, it's got to be something where you're exerting yourself, where, where you're, you're, you know, you're, your whole body's involved almost. Okay? But we want Tabata rounds, you said, was 10, 20 seconds on of intense exercise with 10 seconds off. So we change this and say Tabata rounds with random intervals. But... <clears throat> your, your exertion interval doesn't exceed the 20 seconds, okay? Because you're talking about everything you have energetically and physically and mentally and emotionally all aligned going forward at 100%. It's going to blow your wad after 20 seconds. We can't sustain it. That's why you don't see guys just chasing each other around in the ring. You, as human beings, we can't sustain that. So maybe around 5, 10 seconds. But what you want to do is get an interval timer where the rest period, and the rest period can be as long as you want. It would be five minutes. Okay? Because we don't know the opportunity when it presents itself. And I'll go back to the analogy of a street fight. If I'm moving around in long range, right, and I flick this guy's eye, it doesn't quite work. I, I pot shot him there. It doesn't quite work. And on the next shot, I knee him in the groin, and I see it reacts. I have to go then. I'm waiting, but that whole scenario might take two minutes to, to happen. So I have to be patient because I don't want to be in the kitchen with this guy when he's swinging. So I want to be in long range. I want to inflict damage, but I don't want to go in. So I have to be patient. So this side of things, I have to maintain that cool head and the wide focus, the observance for, for as long as it needs to be. But when I go in, this hopefully won't take any time at all. Hopefully I'll just grab that, mm, take him out one shot, boom, he's done. Hopefully that, that's what happens. If I have to chase this guy with intensity and he's starting to get away from me, I have to go back. So it teaches you patience. So when we have the Tabata rounds, right, you can pick your interval, your rest interview is just lightly jumping rope like this or moving on your feet, right? Anyone can do that, so it's still a workout. When the timer goes off for your intensity, you need to emotionally, physically, and with your breath and your focus, do everything that I went over. So if, if it's push-ups, put this symbol on the ground. That's your concentration point. That's the only thing that exists in your focus. And you, with your feeling, need to <laughs> put all of your willpower into that. And then jump back up when the timer gets in. You move around. And this has to be squared away. And then when the timer goes off again, boom, you're there. Everything, this only thing that exists in your mind for that interval. That's how you train it. And you get a hell of a workout with it, too. It sucks. It really does because you don't know. It's ideal if you get the timer set so that you don't know when the interval's in. Don't set it up yourself. Just have somebody randomly set. And there's plenty of apps for it. Fortunately, I don't know what app I have. We do it just out of sparring. Okay? That's one of the best ways because when somebody's trying to take your head off and you have to remain calm, and you're actually getting hit, and even when you get hit, you're talking about observing where that pain goes through your body, you know, and still keeping a calm head and reacting to the other person. You know, that, that's where it's at. But we don't want to get hit. I don't like, I spar all the time, I don't like getting hit. All right, fuck that. That's for Steve. That's Steve's job. Steve likes to get hit. He, 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 see, he ran away. Oh, he's right there. Fuck. So, that is it as far as what we're talking about. How much, how much time do we have? Anybody? Okay, 10 minutes. So let's, let's have some Q&A.
and then we'll have some TNA, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, hi. First off, uh, really cool speech. Uh, this uh, goes a lot with uh, it's uh, the stuff I've read. But um, I'm someone who, uh, just growing up, I was just emotionally desensitized to a lot of things, just to, like, let stuff roll over and not, like, worry about it. Like, um, I played football and it was, I played linebacker. It was really hard for me to get in that, like, killer mm -hmm. instinct that you were talking about, which my linebacker coach talked about all the time. Um, what would you suggest to try and tap into this for someone like me who has that past? <clears throat> well, I, I would suggest... You probably need a coach. You probably need somebody who um, can calibrate to your emotions to see when they come out. Okay? And me as a coach, I have, I have a couple guys. I work a lot with, with people who have very, it's very similar to PTSD. And so your emotions are, you don't want to let them out because you're afraid of what's going to happen or it brings back the, the abuse again. Right? It triggers all that. So we, we keep it aside. So remember, the, tr the trick is to oscillate between the extremes. Okay, and so if if you're stuck here, and do you, are you a sensitive guy? Like, can you feel emotions? Can you can you you like? Do you ever cry at movies? No. Oh, no. <laughs> See, I can. I can. <laughs> no, but that's it. So you're so you're kind of stuck in the middle, right? So we need to oscillate, and it's okay. We want to be able to cry at movies. We want to get in touch with your feminine side, and we want to be able to express ourselves and our anger, right? So. For me to just give you an exercise, this will help start to move that a little bit. Okay? Even if you're just, just hallucinating that you're mad and that you have killer instinct, we'll start to move it a little bit. But force yourself to go through the physical part of this and, and pretend at getting the, the feelings, and that will start to move things. Me as a coach, like when I, I have a guy who's physically, he's a monster. And he's had, he's had some, some uh, stre uh, PTSD in his life. And um, uh, so it's not that he doesn't have emotions. He's actually a compassionate guy. But what happens is when he gets here, he, he stops. Because I know he's afraid that he's going he's gonna to kill somebody and won't have that control. Okay? So what I have to do as a, as a trainer is elicit those emotions out of him without him actually snapping. And then the, borrow that moment of when they come out and have them turn, tune it back down. I, get, I need to get him mad. So I see it in his face, and he's like this. And then I say, okay, now breathe. Because he has to get comfortable with it, and he has to know he has control. Because that's, that's the fear. You know, your fear may be that you're afraid this is going to re-trigger whatever you know, from your past. And so you don't want to go there. It's just something that didn't serve you in the past. You know, whatever it is, I don't know. But, but simply doing the exercise and, and trying to conjure the feelings will, st will start to move you a bit. But it's not, you know, this isn't a fix-all for everyone, just this physical part. This is a very deep subject that has many implications that took me years to, you know, and I, luckily I was exposed to the, the culmination of this, of guys actually using this in life and death, death situations. But it brought me out of my shell. And so it's not... Um, this is something to help you in the limited time we have, but th that, this is the starting point for you. Okay. okay. Um, for myself personally, um, I've always struggled with my killer instinct to actually just fear of it. Like um, I used to be bossed around with my best mate and nearly killed him when I mm -hmm. snapped. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always been an issue that I want to tackle. I've, I've sort of ex been able to experience it in football. In Australia, we don't wear the gear. It's yeah. just yeah. tackle, and I love that. Uh, now I've done like a bit of boxing, but like if I'm with a female partner, I'm scaring the shit out of it. I'm looking at a, a martial art to do. I think, would you suggest that would be the best way for me to sort of like tackle into it, experience it, and then be okay yeah, with being Yeah, anything it? you're going to spar with. So here's the thing. Like, you, um, for example, on Fridays... I have a ritual of, of wrestling with um, uh, my chiropractor. Yeah, some racket that guy has, right? <laughs> uh, he used to wrestle, where, where do you wrestle? Nebraska, or some, Omaha, something, something like that. He's like 265, and he used to be 300 pounds. The guy's strong. He's a brown belt. I'm a black belt. He doesn't mean shit, right, with this guy. So on Fridays, he, and he wrestles all the time. 
He's very good. We, we go. So there is, what, I'm 180 right now. So whatever that disparity in, in, in weight is, plus his skill. So I spend the day being on the bottom trying not to, to panic like a bitch, right? Because <laughs> he's slack. Yeah, he can do whatever he wants to me. And occasionally I'll catch him. Don't, don't, you know, not that bad. But, but what I do is I use that opportunity for this side. If I can remain calm while I'm underneath and still keep a calm head, and it's like, okay, he's moving his foot there, watch for this, you know, watch the hook there, he's going for your arm. If I can use that, when, and when sparring, when you have somebody, you have the girl, you know, let her go off on you and really maintain a cool head. Even if it's a girl, letting her punch, but still, still boxing and maintaining good, good defense without overwhelming her, you work on yourself at that moment. And you work on that, that calm head and observe things that are out there. Some, some of the, um, I train guys for, for uh, MMA, and some of the things where I have a guy who's um, scared of getting hit. So he, I have to physically put him against the wall and punch him and have him get, have a cool head because it gets him out of his game. So one of the ways you can actually do that is to recite the alphabet while you're getting hit. You know, It's one of the ways. It's not that you want to do that in a fight, but you have to train the brain in order, order to do that. So, but, but really, it's the, it's the observe your emotions where they're at in that moment. And one of those punches gets through, that's the moment that you train yourself to contain your anger. To, to, to of, of course, it's being able to express that killer instinct in a safe environment or in a safe way without me actually having to kill someone. So through doing Hit the stuff, bag, yeah. hitting, or, hitting or the bag. What would you think would be a what martial art would you suggest? Any, any stand-up martial art that you can spar. Because jiu-jitsu is, a lot of jiu-jitsu is this side of the game. There's killer instinct in it, but you don't get to express it that often. You know, you will more with no-gi and with MMA. But um, anything where you can stand up. And, and even when you're standing up, you, you, the, you may not express this. See, to me, JKD, where we, we get the helmets out and we can go full bore with, with armor, that's when you can go. You know, even Krav Maga will do that because they'll, they'll wear the armor. So that's when you can get the expression of that. Okay, when you can, you can really go 100%. But if you're just sparring, you'll do it in smaller moments. When you, when you, when you, when you get a jab or a cross and it rocks them, then you go in with two, three shots and you turn it back off. You're not trying to kill your partner, but you get to express it in smaller doses. Where when you get the gear on, mm, I hate you, Steve. Mm. I like to use Steve. I love to hit Steve. Where is he? I love to hit that guy. You know, like he says, because he'll hit me, and then it pisses me off, and then I get to practice all this stuff, right? So does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, good. Cool. Hi, Ed. Thanks hey, for, for your talk. <laughs> it was very good. It seems like you do this every day. Yeah, so anyway, uh, I wanted to ask, what's the role of diplomacy? Like if... What's the role of diplomacy? So let's say that Shun Tzu was still alive, mm -hmm. and he came and he came across this situation. I wouldn't see him, you know, fighting. He would probably, you know, try to, you know, disturb his opponent or right, right. try to befriend the thing. him. Remember, what is my definition of a street fight? It's a very serious situation where people can die. So if I'm going to make that decision to fight. And it wasn't always that way. I, was, I had a very selfish reason for fighting was to overcome my bully. I wanted to exact revenge on my bullies. And I did. <laughs> I did. I actually traveled back. Anyway. And, and, but, but it evolved. And as my experiences, because it, then it became about like, oh, I'm getting better as a fighter. Then you get the ego. And you're like, I'm a fucking tough guy. Let's see what happens. But you want to get to a point where it's a very serious situation. And I have walked away from more fights than I've ever been in in my life. And morally, if I can justify this situation happening, it's, it's myself or my family's in danger. Okay? It's not some guy, you know, and I have compassion. Even in the midst of a fight, you know, where I've, there, there are times when, you know, your friend's being an ass. Back in the day, I had a friend being an ass. He starts a fight, and a couple guys jump on him. And I, as, a, as a friend, I can't sit there and allow him to, to be killed in front of me. Because two-on-one, is that's a very uh, easy situation, a very easy thing for that to happen. So in, even in the midst of that, when you jump in, I'm not going to go to here with that guy. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to incapacitate them as much as I can, but you will injure to degree. So for somebody who just won't go there, that is a philosophical thing that they have to reconcile within themselves. But I guarantee as a compassionate human being, I have great love for my wife and my family. And if somebody were to attack us, I have no problem going there. But I'm not going to pick some poor schmo on the street and just, you know, or some deranged guy. Even a deranged guy attacks me. I have to assess the situation. Is it worth it to go here or do I need to? But then again, shit can happen. I can, uh, I can be nice to this guy and slip and fall and hit my head and now he's, he's raping my wife or whatever, or now I'm dead just because of this guy. So you have to treat it with the respect that it deserves. But that is an individual choice. That's how I reconcile it, is, you know, this is, this is a serious situation and, you know, a lot's going to have to happen in order for, you know, up to that point in order for me to actually fight. Not always, but, you know, to this level, to this level. Yeah, thanks, Ed, for your mm -hmm. speech. Um, I've taken martial arts and I kind of wanted to ask you the question about um, like in my in my situation you, you kind of taught like if you're in a fight you want to make sure that you can do what you can to stop the fight so I haven't had a lot of training in going to like that you know as far as possible go as far as possible no mercy and and like take it there so I was thinking for me how do I how do I figure that out out in myself and say, hey, okay, this is, if I have to go there, I'm able to go there even if I never trained to do that. You have to train to do that because that will give you choice. You see, that's the thing is this isn't, this is now a choice for me. I can, I have this at my disposal, but that does not in any way dictate that I'm going to use this in, in all of my fighting experiences, but I have it if I need it. If you don't, if you don't train it in some way, you know, if yours is specifically for martial arts, then, then it may or may not be there for you. You don't know. Because a lot of people have killer instinct. It's inborn in us. But, but whether, whether you have the, the tenacity and the skill and all that, you know, to express it when it needs to come out in the right way, you won't know until you actually explore it. So you have to do it. But it's a choice. This is not something that, I believe me, I've used more NLP and more hypnosis getting out of fights than I have actually fighting. Right? There are plenty of ways to avoid fights. That's why I have Steve and, and those guys for now. I just teach them and I live vicariously through them when they go in their pickup scene and they're like, this guy was eyeballing me. It's a mock. They're like, really? What'd you do? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> he didn't like that? So anyway, guys, we're out of time. Uh, so if we want, I'll be available for, available for questions or anyway. I really enjoyed it. I, I thank Anthony and all that stuff. I hope you got something out of it. And uh, thanks. We'll see you again. Yeah.